remember what it was like when you were like in maybe junior high, maybe even before junior high, and you had a sleepover, and it was probably with your cousins because you were small, and your parents wouldn't let you play truth or dare because that's bad. So you played a stupid game where you do, what would you choose? Did you ever play that game? Okay, would you choose to have one arm or one leg? Ooh. Would you choose to be smart or good looking? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad somebody didn't say I choose neither. Would you choose to be deaf or would you choose to be blind? Would you choose to have people respect you or to understand you? Would you choose to either beg for a living or go hungry? See, today's lesson is to try to put us in that place. See, I believe that these Bible stories that, that the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write down are so that we can put ourselves in the place of the different characters and learn about God and also learn about ourselves. And it's going to be about this guy who is blind. And he had to beg. And we're talking about a place where there is no social safety net. There's not even paved roads. There's no seeing eye dog. And so he has got to the place, he's an adult, he has to just sit at the side of the road where he knows the surrounding area, because when you're blind, you get hurt if you go someplace that you don't know. So he goes to the same place every day and begs for a living. And that's a terrible place to be. But there's another thing in the Bible that's very interesting, and we'll, we'll see it. I don't know if we'll have time to look up a bunch of verses about it, but I think you can just... In your mind's eye, see some of those verses that talk about the difference that God talks about spiritual blindness. And there's something in this text, I think, that ties into all of us, whether we are physically blind, whether we're blinded so we can't see reality around us, or whether we have disabilities that limit what we can do. So let's turn in our Bibles to Mark 10, starting at verse 46. Oh, by the way, this is, a, this is kind of an exciting day. We sang Hosanna today. This is Palm Sunday we're talking about. This is him on his way to Jerusalem. Just finished telling the disciples, I'm going to die. We're going up to Jerusalem. They're going to hand me over. They're going to kill me. And in three days, I'll come back to life. However, he's taking two of his disciples just after this verse and sending them ahead to get the colt to ride on for his triumphant entry. And already the crowd is starting to go nuts. Jericho is kind of one of those cities that's known for its fragrances at that time. It was also the capital where all the palms were. So Palm Sunday. So there's a big crowd, it says, and they are just getting excited and heading towards, and they're going to be throwing their coats on the ground and laying branches on the ground and singing, Hosanna to God in the highest. So just to set it up, there's a lot happening, and it's an exciting time, and everybody's in a good mood, other than maybe the guy who knows in less than a week he's going to be killed. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of, can anybody else pronounce that? Was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Oh my. Jesus, we all are going to have needs. Help us to pray in faith that you'll have mercy on us. We know your word says you will. Mm -hmm. 
Many people rebuked him, and they told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. I was talking to somebody this week, and they were talking about a certain individual in their town that I kind of know who he is, who, well, I won't say he freeloads off of people because I don't think, I don't think he has much choice. But the person I was talking to was saying, I don't know what to do. I've given him some money and now he comes to my work every day. And it's embarrassing and I don't know what to do and I can't support him. And I, and but more importantly, they were getting, in some ways they were embarrassed to be associating with somebody of his place. I'm like, wow. I'm wondering if that same group of people from Jericho have been going by that guy's place and they put some money in his hat, whatever. And so every time they go by, he starts to... I wonder if they're just tired of him. Wouldn't that be an awful place? You're blind. They're telling you to shut up. And God's son is going by. It's our job as a church to watch out for those people and to point them to Jesus, never to be a stumbling block in the way of them getting to the Savior. We can't meet everybody's needs. Since Jericho is on the main trail going from Judea back up to Jerusalem, I'm sure Jesus went down that road several times. But today was the day for his healing. We don't know when it's going to be God's day of salvation for somebody. We might not just be fishers of men, we might be catchers of men that day. I'd much rather go catching than fishing, just as a keynote. Um, we have an opportunity to identify people Have you ever noticed that maybe right now at this specific time we don't have a lot of high needs people in our church? But we have, and I'd say if you look at the number of people that are marginalized that go to church, it's because Jesus' people love them just the way he loves them. And it's our, our job to watch out for them and never to tell them be quiet. It's just, I'm going through the text and it's just one of those freebies I'm throwing in as we go. Many rebuked him. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. This would be one of the things that I think that we want to do. We want to recognize that Jesus doesn't need us. He gives us the privilege of being his messenger, to being his hands and feet to people, of being able to be the one that goes and says there's good news here. When we're asked to, to be his witnesses, it's not about trying to go and tell that person all the stuff he has to hear. It's about telling him there's good news. Jesus is calling you. The one who's given me hope, the one who's given me life, wants you to join the family. It's not about me wanting you to join the family. It's about me having the privilege of telling you that Jesus is calling you. There's an interesting verse towards the end of the book. I think it's in John. Just And Jesus is praying and he says to the Father, I have not lost any that you gave me, that you called to me. Have you ever asked Jesus to call somebody into, your, into his family, into our family? It's a different way of looking at salvation, but it's part of the truth. It's like another way of looking at the same truth. If you've had somebody that you care about, probably somebody in your family, 
that doesn't know Jesus or has rejected Jesus, why don't we take a minute, close our eyes, and ask God to call them into the family. Heavenly Father, you know the one I'm speaking of. Please call them. Just call them loud and clear. Even like the way you took Saul, Paul on the road to Damascus and just made it so he, he saw for real, for real that you are calling him. That not us as parents or as friends or as children have an agenda for about them. That is that you are calling them into your family. There's good news. In Christ's name. You know, there's, there's something really unique that when this guy knows that God's calling him, he doesn't just, oh, okay, here I go, I better straighten up and look my best. He throws his coat off, anything that will hinder him, anything that will slow down, anything that entangles us. There's lots of scriptures about that, throwing off and run to Jesus because he's the one with the answers. He's the one that can heal. He's the one that cares enough to not just go on Palm Sunday, but to go to the cross and die for us. And come back to life to show to us. And then revealing himself to us so that we know we have a hope and a future. The Apostle Paul says it would be like, we would be the most pitied of all people if Jesus didn't come back to life. He came back not just, you know, straight to heaven. He came back to make sure you know that he has the keys of death. He has defeated the last enemy. He is the victor over everything. And he's inviting you to come with him into that. It's a special kind of thing when he's willing to do that. So here's, here's back to our friend Bartimaeus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus heals three different blind people in the, that's recorded for us. I'm sure he healed all kinds. Because it says he healed all their diseases and all their... And it's one of the big things that happened in the Middle East where children, two or three days after they're born, they get the sand in their eyes and they go blind. And it's after a little while, there's no healing them, no salve, no anything. So I know if he healed all the diseases, he probably healed dozens, if not hundreds of blind people there. But... It's a special day for him. When Jesus heals other blind people, it's recorded. He does things like um, he'll spit on the ground and make some mud and put it on the guy's eyes. And then the guy says, you know, I see like people walking around like trees. This is just two chapters earlier. And Jesus prays for him again, touches his eyes again, and then he can see clearly. So he had this progressive type of thing. Other people, he laid his hands on them. Same as Peter and Paul when they heal they laid hands on people, and they got their sight. But this is different. There's other people, that Jesus, like the guys who are coming a few chapters earlier where they open up the, the roof and they lower their friend who's a paraplegic down on a mat so he can get in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't say, stand up and walk. He does eventually. First, he dealt with his greatest need. Now, there's some things about Bartimaeus that are very good for us to look at. Bartimaeus understood and recognized who Jesus was. When he says, Son of David, he is referring to the Messiah. He's referring to the one who is predicted and prophesied from ages past that will heal all of their sins, they will wipe away all of their tears. They will usher in God's kingdom. He knows who Jesus is. You ever notice when somebody has a disability, they pick up all kinds of stuff we don't get? Like my aunt that was deaf, she would know who drove up in the driveway without going to the window because she somehow felt the vibration of that old beast of my dad's. She would be more excited. She would see. 
somebody would wake up at night, one of the grandkids, not her grandkids, her nephews and nieces, and she would be the first one awake because she felt the vibration. I think that Bartimaeus, when he heard that there is this Jesus of Nazareth who was healing people, he put two and two together. He had his ears wide open on the side of the road. And whether people were ready to rush him up to Jesus, like the guy who got lowered by his friends, or whether they'd given up on him, he knew who Jesus was. There's another interesting part here. When he, in our text, the next verse or so, he refers to Jesus as rabbi. And we just skip by that real fast because it's lost in translation. But if we were to do the translation of the word rabbi, and I don't pretend to be some Hebrew scholar, because I'm not, but you know, when something just goes by, I, I like to look it up. And so they, they were saying like there's really four words that all come from that same root word. So if we put it in English, we'd see like they all start with, with rab. The word rab, the root word, just means either master or teacher. Then there's rabbi, which means my master or teacher. And it's the next level up. Then there is rabban, which would be our master or teacher. Kind of special. But the greatest would be Raboni, my great master and teacher. Now, I know that in our New International Version we were reading and was up on the thing, I think, and what I was reading, it says Rabbi. But I'll give you a little history about translations, just real quick. When the New International Version was translated and released in 1984, it was aimed at, specifically, people that read the newspaper. Some, some of their literature said age, I mean, uh, reading level of grade four to six, some said five to seven. It's true. The New American Standard came out shortly after, and it was aimed at first and second year university students. And so, obviously, they could be far more elaborate in their, the words they use. That's why I, you know, being the guy who only reads the newspaper level on a regular basis, feel more comfortable with the NIV. It's not inaccurate, it just doesn't have all the description of some of those other texts would have, because it can only use five-letter words. And that's why when you look at the different, the different translations, there's one of them that says Rabbi, there's some that say Lord, there's some that say my Lord, there's some that say my master, there's some that say great teacher or my teacher, but six of them, and they would be the ones that are aimed at the higher reading level, translated as Rabboni, my great teacher and Lord, master and teacher, I mean. He fully understood who Jesus was, so he didn't have a spiritual need to have his eyes open spiritually. But he didn't have a problem with saying, Rabboni, I want to see. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus on the road or on the way. There's some very important lessons there. And if you disagree with me, be mad at me. Don't be mad at the church. I'm not your pastor. I have heard people tell me, don't acknowledge that you're sick because that's giving the devil a foothold. Jesus says, what do you want from me? I want to see over and over in Scripture, he asks people what they want, and if they don't acknowledge what their real need is, sometimes he doesn't take care of it. 
There's nothing wrong with saying the truth. God doesn't hide, and he doesn't want you to hide. He wants you to be honest with him what your needs are and bring your needs to him. He says, make your request known to me. It's very important. Let me, let me put on my other hat. Some of you know me as Pastor John because that's how I was introduced. Some of you know me as John, the guy with the counseling office next door. Some of you know me as just not crazy Uncle John. But let me put on the, the hat for somebody who's done a little bit of thinking and schooling about what people's needs and what developmental needs are. And we all have a need to be known. And we have a need to be loved. And we, one of the things that this world kind of has us do is put on a mask to pretend we're somebody we're not so we fit in. And that's a lie of the devil. Because even if people love you, but you know that it's just a mask they love, you don't get that affection and need that you have. And if you have to pretend you're somebody else to you never feel understood and loved. Earlier in the chapter, when the, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he says, you know, I've tried to keep all these commands since I was young. And Jesus looked at him, and he knew him through and through. And it says he understood and loved him. I think the same can be said here. It's just kind of the way it is. He saw this guy who has such a need and he asks him what he wants and he gives it to him. It's beautiful. He was fully understood and fully loved. He certainly wasn't understood by the crowd around him, was he? He wasn't understood maybe even by his closest friends. You're having to fit in if you're going to survive and you've got such a disability. Jesus loves you the way you are right now. The good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. And he still loves you just the way you are. That's a message that comes loud and clear throughout the whole chapter 10. And he has a plan for your life. And it's a, it's a good plan, not a plan to hurt you. And he doesn't dictate everything you have to do. Some of the other translations will say, Jesus said, you can go on your way now. And he does what he should do without being told he has to. He just continues to follow Jesus. Quite special, special man. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Here's another thing that I've heard. I'm sorry, I give stories, and there's stories about my life sometimes because it helps me in the moment, and I'm going to share a little piece. There's a, I have a brother-in-law who's a lovely man, and I love him. He makes me crazy, you know, I choke him sometimes, but he's a good man. <laughs> and when we had our first son, our oldest two are adopted kids, because we were told we weren't going to be able to have kids, and God just gave us a special extra blessing at the end, and we have Caleb, but I remember when we got the first one, and I was at work, because my brother-in-law wouldn't do this when I was there, because he might be scared that I would punch him, but he came over to the house and said to my wife, it's great that you have enough faith to have your Ishmael. Maybe we should pray that you have enough faith to have your... Wow. Wow. The door is there. And that's what my wife said to him. The door is there. 
Faith is not faith that you will be healed. Faith is faith that Jesus is who he said he was. And that he will keep his word. <laughs> and that he loves you. And that he's powerful enough and able to do anything to help you. That he is willing to stop whatever he's doing. Whether he's in the middle of a parade, victory parade on Palm Sunday. Or whether he's sitting at the right hand of God like right now. Ever interceding for you. He is ready to stop everything he's doing. And use that great power that he has to take care of his children. That's really what the good news is, isn't it? It's not just that we have a powerful God. It's not just that you can be in his family. It's that he's a good God who wants to stop everything and meet you where you're at, knowing who you are, and take care of your greatest need. Does that mean every time somebody gets sick, they're going to be healed? No. That's not what it says. It says that he has your days numbered. And last time I checked, the number of people that get sick and die, or have an accident and die, whatever, is about 100%. <laughs> but that does mean that he's going to be there with you. And he's going to take care of you. And there will be times of healing. And we don't have so many healings in the church right now sometimes because we don't ask. We don't say, I'm going, to I'm going to make a scene and I'm going to ask God. I'm going to acknowledge I have a need that is way beyond anything I can take care of. And I'm going to ask God. I'm going to not care what my brothers and sisters, what my friends, what the rest of the congregation even thinks, I'm going to ask God. Now I'm going to show my age, okay? So you are in that same kind of range, a little bit of gray on the top. But when I was a kid, at least one service a week we would open their prayer room for prayer. And it was the same crazy people like me that would go every week. But I always knew God was real. And part of it was not caring whether my friends were willing to, wanting to go play ball after church or whether my friends wanted to run to the Mac store across the street and get Cokes and chocolate bars. I wanted to spend time with God. I think it would be a good idea if after our last little song there's those of us before we run down and have some food and fellowship and fun that we take a minute, go into the prayer room and acknowledge your need to God and ask him to be there. And it doesn't matter whether that need is to have your blind spiritual eyes open, whether it's to give you a safe place where you will be known and loved, which are real needs, or whether it's for one of your loved ones that's breaking your heart because they aren't living for Christ. Whatever that need is, take a little bit of time and go in there and pray. It's open. Let's pray now, and then I'm going to ask the worship team to come back and, and lead us in another song of worship. Heavenly Father, I pray that you make us brave. Lord, you gave that young man so much courage to stand against the flow and to go to you because you're the only one with answers. Lord, I pray that starting today we make decisions to always go to you when there's a problem and to never give up. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Can I give you one more little freebie before we sing? When Jesus is talking about coming to God to pray, he gives a lot of illustrations. And one of them is like the guy whose neighbor comes in the middle of the night, has guests come, and he comes and he knocks on his door and says, do you have any extra bread you can share with me? I have nothing to feed my guests. And Jesus says, just even though the neighbor says, go away, 
if he keeps knocking on that door and keeps waking him up and he keeps persistently going to him, sooner or later he's going to go and give him the bread. He says, it's not like Jesus doesn't care. He's like the guy who says, go away. But he says, I am like the God who if you keep asking, I'm going to get up and give you what you need. And another time right after that, he talks about the idea that if one of you has a kid and you are God's kids and he asks them for a fish, is he going to give them a scorpion? If our earthly fathers know how to give us good gifts, how much more the one that made you, your heavenly father, will give you a good gift? Just ask and keep asking. Don't give up because the answer was no the first time. Be like the poor guy who's yelling on the side of the road over and over and over again until God comes. Let's worship God together. Thank you, John.